Trap Lines North. In most detail, Trap Line North faithfully follows Jim's diary. It comes as near as being a true story as any yarn you're likely to read. Occasionally, I have put in instances which happened in other winters of the boys trapping or in the lives of their close friends. But as far as I know, none of the facts have been distorted. If you go up to Nikina any time after the 1st November and travel north with a dog sled, you'll find the same hardy youngsters mushing along the snowy trails and making their winter's living. Stephen W. Meter, September 1935 Trap Lines North Chapter 1 The wind had a bite to it. Jim turned the collar of his Mackinac high as he headed westward up the track. Lights had begun to blink in the windows of the settlement, huddled beside the rails, but overhead the cold immensity of the northern twilight still veiled the stars. At seven o'clock, half of Nikina's 600 people would be down at the station to see the Continental Limited come in. Now they were inside their warm log cabins, cooking and waiting for supper. The rustle of that small wind from the north was all that broke the stillness. Jim walked the ties without seeing them. His thoughts were away in the bush. It was only three days since he had come in from the season's last party. A well-fed New Yorker and his two sons, who had gone home happy with their moose head in the baggage car. But already he was restless. The sharp frost of September had long since stripped the hardwoods and there was a skim of ice each morning on the pools beside the track. An inch or two of snow had fallen that first week of October. Winter was near. A faint, far sound in the silence made the boy pause, lifting his head. It came once more, thin and clear. The honk of a Canada goose. Across the pale depths of the evening sky he saw a wedge of dark wings cutting southward. The flocks of pintails and green-winged teal, the mallard and the golden eye, had begun the journey weeks before. When the big gray geese flew south, it meant the end of open water. Jim drew a long breath and quickened his stride. He was grinning when he reached the log house and opened the door. Hey, Lindsay, he called. His chunky 16-year-old brother was curled up by the lamp with a magazine. Don't bother me, he grunted, but Jim made a dive for him and tussled his blonde hair. Listen, lazy bones, he said. Another two weeks and there'll be ice on the lakes. You know how much we got to do while we can still use the canoes, and I bet you haven't got half your outfit together. Ah. Uh grunted Lindsay. I'll be ready when you are. Go on now, let me finish this. It's a darn good detective story. Jim washed in the basin at the sink and sniffed hungrily at the waves of fragrance wafting from the stove. What you got for supper, Ma? Miss Vanderbeck wiped her warm, ruddy face with the corner of her apron. She was a big woman, and she walked with solid authority, but she could move fast when a meal was in the making. Hush now, boy, and see you're ready when the food's on the table. She answered gently. Whatever it is, you can be grateful, with things the way they are. Jim nodded. There were sober lines about his mouth as he returned to the front room. The sheet iron stove radiated a comfortable heat, and the log walls, oakum chinked, gave back the warmth. The boy sprawled on the couch in the corner, taking a thumb-worn letter out of his pocket, reread it for the twentieth time. It was from his father, in the hospital, seven hundred miles away in Toronto. Dear James, it began, The doctors say I'm making good progress, but the way things look, I won't be home for close to a month. When I do get around, I've got to go slow all winter. It seems to be up to you and Lindsay. That trap line down the squaw we looked over last year ought to give you a good catch of fur. Lindsay could handle the Poplar Lake and Squaw Lake country, I think. And Ida and Mary could make a few sets around Wabing till I get back. 
You'll want to be getting on it soon. Don't worry about me. I'm not done yet by a long shot. Take care of things and see your mother has plenty of wood. The grub will last till the buyer comes and we can sell some fur. Love to all, your father. It was hard to think of that great, powerful frame laying helpless in the hospital bed. Big Lindsay Vanderbeck, six foot three in his socks, who could pack a hundred pounds of duffel and two hind quarters of moose meat all day, who could pole a canoe up the stiffest rapids in Ontario and break trail more hours on end than any white man north of the track. Jim squared his shoulders. That letter had made him feel the load of his responsibility. His boyhood, it appeared, was over. Now, at eighteen, he had suddenly became the man of the family. Supper, boys, called Ida from the kitchen. She was three-year Jim Sr., a strongly built girl, fresh-faced, dark hair, almost as tall as Jim himself. Mary, the younger sister, fair like their mother, was already at the table. Did you feed the dogs, Lindsay? she asked, helping herself to fried moose steak. The boy gave her yellow curls a tweak. Not yet, he said. Stuff isn't cool enough. Listen to old Bruno Holler. From the log kennel at the rear of the house came the deep, impatient bark of the big lead dog, supplemented by the course of yips and whines from the rest of the pack. Lindsay took one boiled potato from the heaping bowl. You better eat more than that, said Jim grimly. Last regular potatoes you'll get for eight months. I aim to start tomorrow morning. Soon as that? His mother looked at him in mild surprise. Yes, I saw some geese flying. If there's an early freeze, we won't have much time. Miss Vanderbeck nodded. That's right. I'll go over the wool socks tonight. The rest of your clothes will do. Supper over, the girls set about their dishes washing, while Jim and Lindsay took a flashlight and went out to the kennels. A wash boiler full of cooked cornmeal and meat scraps stood cooling beside the embers of the outdoor fire. As they began ladling it into pans, all seven dogs set up a riot of hungry yips and straining at their heavy chains. They were of mixed breed, two of them tall, raggy police dogs, one or two pure huskies, and the rest across with Husky, Airedale, and St. Bernard. All were big, full-furred, and powerful. Not racing dogs, but strong, steady pullers, built for hard work in the bush. They would have torn a stranger to bits in a matter of minutes, but the boys clouted them out of the way with impunity. The leaders of the three teams were fed first, as canine discipline demanded. Then the others, frantically waiting, got their pans of mush. Jim looked them over critically. They were in good condition, soft, of course, from summer in town, but a few days of work in the snow would remedy that. Another two weeks, he told Bruno, and you'll be eating whitefish again. Won't be long now. Half an hour later, the boys left their mother and the girls darning a basket full of heavy wool socks and went down to the tracks to the storehouse. It was one of the few frame buildings in town, the Vanderbeck's place of business ever since they had come out of Nakina in 1925. Here the cans and cases and bags of food were stored, the tents and bed rolls and pack sacks, grub and outfit for the parties of hunters and fishermen who journeyed up from the states in eastern Canada each summer. They had followed Lindsay Vanderbeck from his old haunts on the New Brunswick Salmon Rivers out to this vaster, wilder, more abundant country in the north. It in steadily increasing numbers they had come, until two years before. Then, with the grip of the Depression tightening over the continent, guides and outfitters had found themselves almost without employment. The Vanderbecks were more fortunate than some. They had among their clientele a few loyal sportsmen with enough wealth to go into the bush regardless of conditions. But, even so, there had not been enough business the last two years to make a living. 
Jim looked ruefully around the big, half-empty place, wondering whether he would ever see it filled again and busy. His own outfit and Lindsay's were packed against one wall. With a notebook and pencil, they went over the items one by one. There was 200 pounds of flour, 50 pounds of sugar, 25 pounds of beans. There were half a dozen big cans of dried milk and as many of baking powder and of jam. There were cartons of macaroni and several sacks of potatoes and boxes of dried fruit. There was tea, coca, salt, candles and matches along with a few other wood necessities. In three big bags there were 300 pounds of cornmeal for the dogs. Beside the piles of food stood their guns and elder downs, axes and paddles, and there were five or six traps from the mail order house. For the most part, they would use last year's traps, stored at their line cabins in the bush. Everything was there, Jim found, checking the list for the third time. They would be ready to start in the morning. Down at the station, he found the owner of the town's one motor truck and made arrangements to have their supplies hauled to the lake. The limited had come and gone. A handful of Indian and white men still hung around in the lee of the red frame station building out of the wind. Hi, Jim, they said one after another. Hi, Jim. A short, compacted, built French trapper climbed down off his perch on the baggage truck. So, he smiled, you're going in, huh? Jim nodded. Tomorrow, when you starting, Emil? Oh, pretty quick. I just come back from down in my country. Plenty of rabbit this year. That ought to make plenty of fisher. See any moose? Oh, sure. Two or three cows and calves. Some fine young bulls. I see your party got a nice head. That's fine, Jim. You make a good guide. What did you hear from your dad? Jim told him such news as he had. I guess Lindsay and I'll be trapping for the family this winter, he said with a certain pride. Emil Coot grinned. That's right, he said. You boys will catch plenty of fur, I bet. You got a good country, Jim. That Squaw River's full of mink. The Frenchman's face turned serious then, and he lowered his voice a little. I come by your family's place on Waba two or three days ago, he said. Everything's all right, only maybe they'll have some company this year. That Cree Jolique has come back. Got a camp about three miles from you. Eskimo squaw and six kids. They'll kill a lot of moose, I expect. Set some traps, too. That'll be all right, said Jim. There's room in that country, and Ma gets along with them fine. Well, good luck, Emil. Hope you catch lots of fur. We'll be getting on an early start in the morning. He shook hands with his friend and picked Lindsay up at the station restaurant and set out for home along the ties. The wind had died to a whisper and the cold was more intense. From behind them, down in the Indian settlement, came the faint, wailing howl of a husky dog and off to the right, above the black spear points of spruces, wavered the fingers of white and blue and green, went searching up the sky. Look at those northern lights, said Jim. Change of weather, I reckon. Ought to be cold, clear day tomorrow. 